Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. We're here with Katie Gross, the Chief Customer Officer at Suzy. Katie, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that's joining us for this fireside chat. This discussion is designed to be one of the most informative and action oriented discussions that you'll attend. And it's with one of my favorite brands, and I'm personally very excited. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer of the real time market research platform, Suzy. And we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands to help them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for insights that drive business growth. As a huge guacamole fan, I am personally very excited to be joined on the virtual stage by Ali Sigmon of Chipotle. I will let her introduce herself. Ali, over to you. Hi, Katie. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad that you're a fan of guacamole. I am too. And I think I saw in this chat that someone's 15-year-old son is obsessed. Yes, that's great. <laughs> um, I'm the manager of consumer insights at Chipotle, and my primary role is to focus on menu innovation. Um, and that's at every stage. That's from identifying, you know, white space opportunities um, to concept testing, all the way down to message refinement and even ad testing. Um, we also, our department, which is composed of three people, is also responsible for, you know, brand health um, tracking, sensory testing. Um, we also have a recent um, member of the Consumer Insights team who focuses on gleaning uh, consumer insights from social. Um, in addition to menu innovation, um, you know, if we're trying, to, I'm the consumer advocate and also trying to you know, make sure that the company and it, everyone inside knows the, you know, consumer mindset. And, you know, also, that also involves being responsible for um, kind of cascading cultural insights throughout the organization. That's amazing. Amazing. So I'll start with an easy question. How has COVID-19 impacted insights at Chipotle? Yeah, I think um, it has and it hasn't. And, and I say that because I am always out there, always combing, always mining, always looking for what's next, what's new, what's happening. Um, we have done a lot of like, online research um, methodologies before, and so we've continued to lean more into that. But when you're dealing with food and products, you can only talk about things in abstract, you know, for so long before you actually have to kind of see what that experience or what that food product um, would be like. So we've definitely had to um, go back and take a look at some of our methodologies and restructure and pilot new approaches um, to see how we can do things safely um, that are going to give us the, you know, information that we need. So that's definitely impacted um, us in how we do research and also just the, the amount of volume of research that we're pushing out because we're living through you know, this huge cultural moment that is drastically changing consumer needs across all industries. So in addition to, you know, the daily um, kind of research that is involved with product development, we're trying to understand, you know, how consumers are reacting in moment and how they might react 18 months from now. That's great. So you've been piloting a lot of new approaches. Has that been fun as an insights leader? It's been fun in the way that like a roller coaster is exciting <laughs> and terrifying at the same time. Um, I think we are always trying new things and, you know, the, the fear is like, oh, it's not going to work out. But um, we have a really supportive, um, great team, great partners. And um, it's actually in some ways we found that some approaches that maybe like a, a, a plan B have actually turned out to be great. And even, you know, if we aren't in the situation, we hope to carry them forward because we got some really great insights and it was a really good approach. And maybe we're getting more um, authentic um, responses with people more comfortable in their natural environment. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. So talk to me a little bit more about your team at Chipotle. Is there a department or your company that kind of owns the consumer relationship and the data? And what does that mean for Chipotle? Yeah, and this is like fully a cop out answer, but you know, with you know, in the retail, you know, being in the retail hospitality, you know, industry, like we all have to own, you know, our relationship with our consumer. It does no good if if I'm the only one who owns it and our, you know, our crew member who's having that direct interaction with um with our consumer in the store doesn't have some sort of understanding. Um, at the same time, I think that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, insights, consumer insights, pieces of consumer data information coming from all different places within the organization. 
And so um, while my role is consumer insights, I think, you know, it's important to have those cross-functional conversations because the truth ultimately lies in, in how you weave those data points together. So, um, you know, in, in a certain function, it, way too, I mentioned, we're just, you know, two people, um, you know, that, that focus more on the consumer insights part of things and we can't do everything. And so in a certain way, um, we act as more like internal consultants. Um, mm-hmm. And so there might be um, people who run things past us or like, hey, we're looking at doing this or, you know, we have a vendor who says they're going to run this, you know, ad lift study for us. Can you take a look at the questionnaire and we'll sign off? I mean, do I lead the consumer in 101 uh, kind of overview presentation for new hires? Yes, but we all from the consumer. Yeah, that's awesome. So it's everyone from the crew members to supply chain managers. Everybody becomes customer obsessed over at Chipotle. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. So as an insights leader, then how have you been kind of empowering those end users? And how have you been maybe socializing some of the data so that they can be more directly responsible and kind of touch and feel the data more often? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's you know one of the the chief things, and that's why I re- referred to myself earlier as a consumer advocate. It's not just about the insights that you create; it's how you broadcast and share them out. I'm personally, my brand is infotainment. Um, I want people to be excited um, to you know when they're coming to a research degree for me, they know that they're gonna be, it's gonna be an event, it's gonna be an experience. And so I've seen so many awesome pieces of research die a slow death and a sad pie chart. So I want to make sure I really bring those to right to life. And so that might be including videos. We've done, um, you know, we did a college ethnography study where we actually built like a dorm room and we we assigned people to different fictitious Chipotle colleges. Um, I may have done um you know, a research top line to Enrique Iglesias by um, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, and I think when you are open like that and you, you make it entertaining, it really engages dialogue, which is most important to me as a researcher, is to make sure that I'm connected with all my cross-functional teams and that they feel that they can approach me and just have a conversation about, you know, what they're interested in learning. Yeah, I can see a lot of comments coming through on the chat. Everybody loves that kind of infotainment um, phrase you use. And and you're so right. Although we make geek out on a pie chart, it's not for everybody at the company by any means. How about the most interesting learning that you have found out about consumers over the past few months since COVID? What's been the most interesting thing you've found? Yeah, um, there's a lot of interesting things. Um, you know, one of the things I'll share is, uh, you know, Chipotle is, um, you know, we have real food. And by that, we mean it's like fresh, you know, unprocessed, you can name all our ingredients. And we ask consumers, you know, in in the wake of, you know, COVID-19, you know, how important is real food to you? And, you know, our consumers, you know, 60, about 60% said it's just as important, but 30% said it's more important than ever. And you think about how this kind of, you know, food as medicine was already a trend, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, before this. And now more than ever, like food is, you know, it's a it's about immunity. It's your shield. It's an armor to keep you safe. And it's taken on like a different kind of lens. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. we're always looking at health and wellness and diet trends. And I think that was something that was really interesting. At the same time, we also saw that, you know, it's not just about diet and health, there's also mental health and the things that help you kind of cope with a really stressful situation. And how do people cope? Sometimes with comforting foods. And so we saw an increase in our queso sales um, in, in March and April, you know, so people are looking for food to be healthy, but they're also trying to be mentally healthy and, and find those things that give them a little bit of comfort. So I think that's interesting as we explore that kind of dynamic. Yeah, I love that case of sales increasing during a global pandemic is a real, real fun fact. So I know that the uh, Chipotle chief restaurant officer, Scott uh, Boatwright, was recently quoted as saying, and I'm going to use his quote here, that a majority of the folks that came in through digital during COVID were brand new users to your brand. And we recognize that the digital consumer remains digital and the in-restaurant consumer remains in restaurant. There's very little overlap but surprisingly, they're two very different consumers. 
which I found fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so as an insights leader, how have you had to change your process and really dive into these two new and very different types of consumers? Yeah, and I think, you know, this was, um, this came out of some work done by my uh, colleague, Mengren Howe. Um, it was really looking at spending over time. And we saw that, you know, consumers weren't really switching channels. Um, they were like a delivery consumer is pretty much, you know, staying as a delivery consumer. Your in-restaurant consumer is pretty much staying in restaurant. And so I think, you know, we're actually in the midst of conducting, you know, um, some foundational research to almost segment by channel usage and really understand, you know, those motivations and those mindsets and those priorities amongst like different, you know, channel users. But it does also give us some different insights into how we might um, target, you know, different consumers with um, messaging that's more relevant for them or if there's certain promotions or activations that, you know, are more relevant for an in-store consumer than for a digital consumer or understanding barriers um, to those different channels. Um, you know, we had conducted some research, I think, even back in early 2019 with um, in-store um, Chipotle consumers who are using digital um you know, food apps for other companies, but not for Chipotle to really understand what the barrier was. And I'm really glad we did that because, hey, guess what? 60% of our total revenue comes from online sales right now. Yeah, that's amazing. A lot of the comments coming through are saying they people feel very safe um, with the carry out and, and take out from Chipotle. So that's really nice to see from our audience there. <laughs> Um, so it obviously talks that article about how Chipotle changed super quick um, in the business model at the very start of COVID-19 to focus more on these online orders. How did your department, the Consumer Insight Department, actually kind of partner? If you could talk in more detail about how you partnered with the various parts of the business to make that happen. Right. And I think, you know, the reason we were able to pivot quickly is because it was already a priority long before. Um you know, so when I joined um, Chipotle in, I think, about September of 2018, like one of the first pieces of research I did was to help come up with the consumer facing name for what are now known as our Chipotle's, which is all about having, you know, convenient access um, like a drive through, but actually the future of drive throughs um, so that people can place an online order and pick it up and they don't even have to get out of their car. So it was always a priority of the company. But I think in recent um, months, obviously with the shift of things, we we primarily focused our research on that online experience and, you know, what are some of those, um, you know, brand reputation or brand um you know, different promotions, um, things of that nature, maybe even digital exclusives. Um, even this week, we launched um, uh, family extras. And we know that there's a lot of people that are at home with their families, for better or for worse. And um, we wanted to offer, you know, something that um, really speaks to families at home. So now you can enter a code and you get free chips and your favorite guac. Um, so yeah, definitely partnering with, you know, um, you know, our off-premise team, our menu innovation team, our brand team, even our supply chain team um, on different types of consumer facing messaging and, you know, really rethinking about our digital experience. Like what if that was your, you know, entire touch point for your brand was only within your app. So you know, taking that kind of mindset and looking into how we might be able to, you know, make some changes within our app experience to deliver on some of those other key important brand experiences. Yeah, that's really interesting. So switching gears slightly into kind of research and insights during this time. So obviously what we hear from our clients every day, and this is not just this year, but budgets are being cut, teams are being restructured. You're a team of two, is that right? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're a team of three, um, one focuses three, yeah. exclusively on social, but then it's, I'm 50% of the uh, primary research. <laughs> <laughs> right. So with that said, how do you kind of balance that increased pressure on budgets, whilst also increased pressure on timing and getting consumer results back fast, and also, of course, maintaining the quality of the research that you're conducting? How do you uh, juggle all of that? Um, some days excellently, some days really poorly, I have to admit. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's really what it comes down to is having honest conversations early 
with your stakeholders and understanding the context of the ask, what it's going to impact, what they're hoping to get out of it, what the resulting actions are, and then ruthlessly prioritizing. I've said that before, but that's truly what we have to do sometimes in order to make sure that you know we're hitting everything within the debt timelines um, so that the research is actionable because nothing makes me sadder than you know delivering results two days after you can do anything about it. Um, you know, the other part of it is, you know, trading off, like, you know, having that conversation about priority and, and is this more of a validation or is this true exploration? Are we, are we, do we feel 80% comfortable with where we're at or we don't really know? And then kind of flexing the approach and maybe even like the, uh, the amount of rigor depending on that. So, um, you know, not every project um, gets A plus work. I wish every project could get A plus work. Sometimes it's okay to slide by with a B. Yeah. And that's, that's just how it is. Yeah. We, and we've definitely heard from a lot of our clients that they used to have their internal um, customers fill in very large, le- lengthy kind of research briefs. Has that disappeared and just replaced with a quick, quick phone call now? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, I think what I try to make it is easy. And, and honestly, too, I think I, I lose some of that subtext and those important things to know. Um, you know, if I make somebody fill out a form. And that's just how our organization works. I understand at different organizations that is um, helpful. So for me, it's easiest to just jump on a call sometimes um, or video chat right now or, um, you know, or even go back and forth in an email um, just to really dig into, you know, what that is, um, what they're hoping to get out of it, what those metrics of success look like. Um, and, and that's really how we do it. Yeah, that's great. Um, so thinking about DIY research, um, now switching gears ever so slightly, what were your initial reactions to DIY, the concept of DIY research, and how has that evolved over 2020? Yeah, I mean, I've always been a user of DIY research. That's just been kind of my research upbringing. So, um, you know, for me, and also like at Chipotle, like we have you know, we move, we're a lean team, we move really quickly, um, you know, and into order, in order to react with culture, sometimes you have to move at mm-hmm. the speed of culture. And so DIY really lends itself to getting those quick responses. Um, you know, and I think that, but it's really, it's about having a variety of, of tools for you to utilize. And so um, DIY is great on some of those projects where, you know, I got maybe a week, maybe a couple weeks to turn something around. Maybe the question is pretty simple. Um, If it's something that's more complex or it has more of a foundational basis or or could have a long lifespan, then that's maybe when we would go to, um, you know, some of our vendor partners to help us, you know, manage and execute um, a broader scale research project. So I think there's a place for all. Yeah, it sounds like they interplay. And uh, of course, can, DIY hasn't necessarily replaced your agencies and consultants. Do you have any examples of how you've kind of used DIY and then agencies and consultants together on a similar project or on the same kind of talk track? Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. Um, you know, I might do like a more formalized um, concept test um, you know, with one of our vendor partners um, to manage and execute that. But then if I'm coming down to maybe some like copy points or copy task, um, that's where I might just go in and do something with DIY. Um, or if, you know, it, I mean, it often just speaks to the iterative nature of research and that um, maybe for one project, I have budget to go to a, a vendor for something, um, but other parts of it are a, a little more scrappy. And so that's when we, we see what that research priority is. And that's where I might lean into DIY or, or um, something of that nature. Yeah, that's great. And actually, one of the questions that's coming in from the audience there, curious to see if you have your own panel um, or if you're using um, other suppliers such as Susie. <laughs> uh, so one of those questions there. What are those tools? If you could be a little bit more specific, Ali, that would be great. Did it, is this a plug question? Um, it yeah, came from the I'll, audience. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about some of some of the tools we use. So, I mean, we mm-hmm. do have a relationship with Susie, and so we do leverage that um, that panel for some of our quick turnarounds. We have our own in-house proprietary um, Chipotle consumer panel called the Guac mm-hmm. Stars, and we leverage that Love more that. for qualitative um, qualitative explorations. Um, we also, um, you know. 
we have a huge base of customers and they're opted into our marketing emails. And so from time to time, we reach out directly to those who are already in very engaged with our brand. Um, not necessarily what I manage, but there's, you know, when I talked about just, it's important to talk with one another. We have our, you know, social listening team and we have our own like um, Chipotle social media channels. And there's a lot of great rich information that comes in there. So, um, you know, in addition to some of the other like vendor, um, you know, relationships that we have in, in some of their panels. Yeah, that's great. There's a lot of love for the word guac stars out there. <laughs> great creative naming. Um, and so how have, how have you best kind of been able to help support all of your internal clients with very rapid decision making? Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, it all comes down to that kind of alignment and that initial conversation, like, what's the ask? What's the timing? Like, you know, what are the trade offs? If you're giving me three projects, what's the most important one? Um, so I think that's, you know, that's probably the most important thing. The, the other thing is, you know, and I talked about like the A plus work versus the B as much as I, and this is like the balance of everything, right? As much as I love doing like a beautiful PowerPoint display with like video clips and, and really like pulling in um, insights from, you know, other parts of the company and even like how that's being reflected in culture and what that means, not every question really begets that treatment. And so sometimes like as much as I would love that and I have to like rein in myself, it's a quick email. It's like, hey, we did this, look at this, boom, go. Mm -hmm. And if not anymore, I rely on them to come back and, you know, if they want the full research treatment, I'll give it to them. But, you know, sometimes that's not really needed. It's just a quick answer. And so I don't want to, you know, waste my time um, building this elaborate, um, you know, output that's not really going to see the light of day. Yeah, especially not with the pie charts. <laughs> We actually have a question from the audience from Sydney, Australia. Ooh. So it is Peter Wilson. Hi, Peter. Uh, he says, good day from Sydney, Australia. Really interested to know how COVID-19 has impacted that in-store restaurant ordering over the counter um, and how that's different from mobile and kiosk. And he says, forgive me for not knowing. Unfortunately, Chipotle does not have a footprint in Australia right now. <laughs> And, and that's unfortunate. I keep saying, I, I mean, I'm ready. I'm ready to go understand the Australian yeah. consumer. Send me there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the challenges right now is, you know, it, it depends on the local state jurisdiction in, in terms of what dining areas are even open. So we've seen just a lot of dining areas um, close. Um, so it's, it's harder to gauge like how that in in-store, that what that in-store dining experience or order experience um, but yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that we've done, um, you know, one of the benefits of being in store is that you have that unlimited customization and you can go through and you can see it and you can say, give me that extra shake of chicken. Can I get a little bit less rice? And so, um, knowing that that is such an integral and important part of our in restaurant experience, we had customization within our app, but we really just dialed it up. And so I think it was in maybe April or so, um, is part in part of our app experience, we really promoted that there was unlimited customization. So even within the like our digital experience, you can ask for light chicken, extra chicken, um, and do as many customizations so that your digital experience pretty much closely matches your in restaurant um, experience. Um, so those are, I guess, some of the things that we've done. Yeah, that is awesome. Some other uh, kind of points coming through. Ellen Young said, love the response about how you can have very slim deliverables, but still robust. Preach. <laughs> so thank you, Ellen, for your participation there. Um, a couple of other questions we have coming through here. Uh, what are your favorite research vendors? Oh, I'm happy to share the stage. So you feel free to. <laughs> My favorite research vendors are the ones that um, are you know, really thought leaders that will jump on the phone with me and like really hash out things um, that are, will turn around um, results pretty quickly that are, uh, that are flexible, that are affordable, um, mm -hmm. and that laugh at my dad jokes. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Some really great questions coming through. Steve Olson asks, for things like testing, oops, this, the chat keeps running through. So for things like testing the app, do you leverage research beforehand versus putting it into field and just seeing what, <laughs> what learnings you can find on the way? 
Yeah, I think we actually have, um, you know, and I would, I would wish I had my UX, um, we have our product development team and there is a separate like UX kind of arm of things um, mm -hmm. so that they could better speak to the app testing specifically. But we do believe in test and learn at Chipotle. And so I know that there's different tools that we have. So sometimes um, we'll use like an um, in app or a website API to intercept Chipotle consumers and walk them through maybe a prototype of a, an ex a digital experience and get some feedback on that in advance of you know, launching it nationally and seeing, you know, the, you know, analytics come in and where there's, you know, maybe those friction points. So we do test, um, and I'm not sure about everything, but we do test some different things if we're un unlocking a new feature. Um, so the, the, that gets different phases of, you know, research. Yeah. That's awesome. Another great question coming through from Janet Standen. Do you use personas at Chipotle or mind states as a framework for learning? We haven't yet um, done that, and I should I should clarify that my myself and my boss JD Dory um, joined the organization in fall of 2018, and we had to build everything. Um, there was you know building a brand tracker, building our ad testing, building our menu innovation stage gate process. So we've been busy, <laughs> but um, I know that um, that is something that we're looking forward to doing. Um, it, you know, I, and I think I heard um, someone mention this in one of the earlier conversations is that, you know, um, you know, doing the persona or segmentation work, um, it really hinges on how the uh, organization adopts it. And so if that's something that we're looking to pursue, um, we want to really make sure that we do it right. Yeah. Some really amazing questions coming in. Peter Wilson asks, menu board optimization, any well war stories that you can share? <laughs> I haven't actually had the um, experience of doing the menu board um, optimization research. I know in in a prior research life, I've done things with eye tracking research. Um, and, you know, I think um, especially um, we have our new Cultivate Center that um, was open and which actually has like our test kitchen and like a, a prototype restaurant in there. And I cannot wait until um, I can get in there and, and try some different things um, to see about menu board op optimization. I mean, the truth is Chipotle's menu um, doesn't change dramatically. Um, we do have some, you know, new things coming up. Carne asada is coming back soon. Um, but yeah, we'd love to do some more menu um, board optimization research. Yeah, that's wonderful. So we only have about two minutes left. Um, so I just wanted to ask um, as a last question, what advice would you give to other insights leaders about navigating through um, kind of the remainder of 2020 and thinking about a 2021 recovery period when it comes to insights and, and consumers? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, Wow, that's that's a big question. Big question. Uh, <laughs> nice easy one to end. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, you know, there's, especially for the restaurant industry, it's been really tough. And I know a lot of like small business owners too, it's been really tough, but there's also been, you know, opportunity. And there's also been, I feel like some silver linings, like seeing how communities have really rallied together to support one another. And we see that even reflected in how our consumers are, you know, you know, reacting. And so we, um, we enabled a roundup feature and I forgot how much money we've raised for, um, you know, I think we used the, the urban league and also, um, we have a new one in there that's, um, for the kids in need foundation. So that is a really great learning. Um, but taking a step, taking a step back, um, you know, I think that there's, you know, doing what you can to survive for today because it's, it's hard, but there's also looking forward and thinking, you know, like one of the things that people look forward to is new items and, you know, that surprise and delight and whimsy. And so we got want to make sure that we, we don't forget about looking into the future and seeing how these things are adopting or changing. So, you know, I, I think it would be a mistake to think that this is a blip in time and we're going to revert back to how things were. Um, we should really look forward to how things are going to change. So maybe that means that people are going to be ordering digital more often. Maybe that means that, um, you know, the, the concept of food safety is going to be at the forefront of people's minds for a long time. Maybe this means that people are more open to things like you know, driverless cars. And, you know, maybe that's a little bit further out, but um, 
you know, I would say um, that there's a lot, it's really interesting to be living through this moment. And mm -hmm. while at times I'm uncomfortable, there's, it's like a great kind of fertile ground for um, innovation. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that changes. Yeah, it's a great reset. Thank you so much. You mentioned dad jokes earlier, so I will tell a dad joke that Gabe McElwain put on, which is, my 10-year-old always says, whenever we see a road sign that says, road works ahead, his kid says, I sure hope it does. So ending on a dad joke, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody that joined us. You can find out, um, obviously, everything you want from Chipotle on the Chipotle app. I know I'll be ordering this this evening um, and anything you want to know about Susie visit Susie at Susie.com or Susie.com for our website and uh, enjoy the rest of IIEX thank you everybody bye thank you bye